In Job chapter 37, begin reading with verse 6, we read these words, For he saith to the snow, Be thou on the earth, likewise to the small rain, and to the great rain of his strength. He sealeth up the hand of every man, that all men may know his work. Then the beasts go into dens, and remain in their places. Out of the south cometh the whirlwind, and cold out of the north. By the breath of God frost is given, and the breadth of the waters is straightened. Also by watering he wearieth the thick cloud, he scattereth his bright cloud, and it is turned round about by his counsels, that they may do whatsoever he commandeth them upon the face of the world in the earth. He causeth it to come, whether for correction, or for his land, or for mercy. Hearken unto this, O Job, stand still, and consider the wondrous works of God. Look again at verse 13. He causeth it to come, whether for correction, or for his land, or for mercy. I want to preach to you today on the subject of wintertime, on the subject of wintertime. To most people in the harvest fields of God today, there is only one season of the year, and that is the season in which to gather in the harvest of the crop. All of the time they are out in the field winning souls to Christ. They are trying to reap the harvest, and the only equipment that they have is harvesting equipment. If they are not in the business of harvesting, they do not know what to do. But there are others of God's laborers in the field today who are aware that there are two other seasons on God's calendar. They realize that you cannot have much of a harvest unless first there has been some sowing of the seed unless first there has been the cultivating of the crop, in order that there may be some harvest to be gathered in. Jesus said one day in the fourth chapter of the book of John to his disciples, he said, I'm sending you out to reap that on which you did not bestow labor. Other men labored, and you're entered into their labors. And so the man who goes out to reap the harvest where somebody else has sowed and somebody else has cultivated That person is just entering into other people's labors, and they need to recognize that the sowing and the cultivating is just as essential as the reaping. But there's another season in God's calendar that many people are not aware of, and that's the season that we want to be talking about this day. That's the season that's called wintertime. The Bible says in Genesis 8, 22, While the earth remaineth, Seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. God said as long as the earth remains, there shall be summertime, but there shall also be wintertime. Wintertime is an, is an experience in every believer's life that sometime or other he must go through. If you're in the middle of the wintertime now, this message will bless you right now. But if you're not yet in the wintertime, but will enter into the wintertime in the middle of next year, then this message will be a blessing to you out there. But what do we mean by wintertime? Wintertime is an experience when you are cut off from the reaping, when you're cut off from the sowing, when you're cut off from the cultivating, and you need to realize what it's all about. You say, well, preacher... I'm not in wintertime. I've been harvesting for 12 to 15 years. I've been in church after church after church where we won 100 souls this year, 75 this year, 40 the next year, and we're just in one continual reaping in the uh, place where I am. Well, my friend, there will come a time, there will come an hour when the reaping will stop. There will come a time when the wintertime will set in. Now, I want to ask you today, are you winterized? Are you prepared for the experience in life when your sowing shall be cut off and when your cultivating shall be cut off, when your reaping shall be cut off and you're in the cold frost of God? Are you prepared for that? Or is the equipment that you have only harvest time equipment? If that be your case, then I hope you will listen to this message from the book of Job. Verse 13 says that God sends the winter time in a Christian's life for three different reasons. He causes wintertime to come for correction, for his land, or for mercy. The first reason that God says he'll send the wintertime into a believer's life for is for correction. While you and I are sowing and cultivating and reaping in God's harvest, 
we may be sowing and cultivating things that are not good seed. We may be sowing some wild oats. And we may be some cultivating some jimson weeds and some Bermuda grass. Now, you may get away with sowing wild oats and cultivating wild oats and reaping wild oats, but the time will come when winter time will come in your life, and when winter time does come, God will correct you. He will cut out the weeds. He'll cut out the wild oats. He'll get rid out of your life those things that are not beneficial. As Jesus talked about the Pharisees one day in the 15th chapter of Matthew, he said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. The scribes and the Pharisees grew in the garden of God for many, many years. To many people in the day in which they lived, they thought the scribes and the Pharisees would continue on from now on. But there came a time and an hour when God rooted out the scribes and the Pharisees out of the field of God. And when they were completely removed because they were not planted and they were not sold as God intended for them to, to be sold. What is a case in point? There was a day and an hour when Lot's sowing and cultivating were not according to the will of God. He went out and pitched his tent towards Sodom. He sowed his seed. He cultivated his lands. Everything seemed to be going his way. He got to a place of prestige in the town. He was sitting in the gate. He was known among the elders of the land. His daughters married the elite of the town. And everything seemed to be going his way, though his life was filled with wild oats. He was not faithful to his God. He was not faithful to the work of God. But as far as everybody knew in that day, Mr. Lot was getting away with many things. He seemed to be defying God's law of sowing and reaping and winter time. But the time came when God set winter time into Lot's life. First of all, it was a mild winter. The mild winter came in Lot's life when a group of the enemy came over and took his family away for a few days. And Uncle Abraham had to go and get his family back. That was a mild winter. And Lot paid no attention to the mild winter. And so God had to send a worse winter time in his life. He had to send a winter time in his life that was very severe, very harsh, very cold. And when that winter time came, it cut out of Lot's life. Many things that could not stand the winter time. You know what it cut out? It cut out all of his property. It cut off all of his family. It cut off his testimony. All he got out was by the skin of his teeth. Why? Because in the days of his sowing and cultivating, he was sowing wild oats. Now, I want you to know, friend, though you may be sowing many wild oats now and have been sowing them for years and getting away with it, don't boast yourself about that fact because the time is coming when winter time will come and when it gets here, it will root out everything in you that is not for God's interest. Winter time will come to correct you and kill off those things that are not helpful to you in your testimony for Jesus Christ. Many times in the work of God, we accumulate habits and attitudes that are not good. But in the winter time, God comes along and cuts all of these things off from us in order that we can be better used of God the next time we go out to sow and to cultivate and to reap. And so, my friend, if, the, if you think you've made, have made the grade, you've gotten away with many things, just hang around till God's winter time comes along and you'll see that you have not gotten away with one thing. But maybe I'm talking to somebody today who says, Preacher, so far as I know, I'm in the middle of winter time right now. It's cold, it's frosty, the sun is hid. I'm in the middle of a big night time and I just can't explain it. So far as far as I know, I'm trying to do the best I can to serve God. So far as I know, I'm in the will of God in my life. What is the reason for a winter time in my case? Well, we find out in the book of Job that God not only sends a winter time for correction, but he sends winter time for the benefit of the land. I thank God that that's in, in there. Many times that explains what may be happening in your church, in your home, in your community. One of the main reasons for winter time is in order that a church may be benefited. 
You may wish that everything were running rosy around your church and that everything was all right, but the greatest thing that may be happening in your life right now is for your church to be in a turmoil and in a strife and in a dither. You say, preacher, surely not. If things were running more smoothly, we could win more souls to Christ. We could have a better testimony for Jesus. Well, my friend, God has sent winter time into your church to get rid of a lot of driftwood that accumulates during the summertime and during the harvest time. And God sends the winter time to kill off a lot of harmful insects that have come in with the crop that you brought in to your church. Many times when sowing, you reach out and gather into the net of God. Many things there that are no good, many things that are deadly and harmful, and it would defile and devour the flock of God. God sends the winter time along in order that he may kill out everything that would hinder and harm the work of God in the midst of his church. You say, well, preacher, the thing I'm afraid of, if this thing gets any worse in my church, that there'll be nothing left. We've gone down, down, down in Sunday school, in training union, in prayer meeting. We've gone down in finances. Every way we've gone down. Well, my friend, if you have 10,000 Jimson weeds in your harvest and you only have five good seeds, it will be better for you to let God kill the 10,000 Jimson weeds in order that the five seed next year may have the land on which to grow and to produce and bring glory and honor to God. God does not get his glory and honor out of the jimson weeds and out of the Bermuda grass, but out of the fruit that he has planted as a seed there in next year's harvest. And so God's always produced through his seed and not through the weeds. And so don't ask God to take off the trouble and the trial and the cold spell off of your church while God's trying to kill out and kill off what would hurt you and harm for you. Stop squalling about it. If you're in the will of God, the winter time will make a better church by getting rid of some things out of your church. It may be that your church has been a shouting church. Everybody was happy. You came to church and all the time they were shouting and praising God. But the shouting has died down. The shouting has gone in its place. There is no... The services seem to be stopped up and nothing seems to be going. Well, just be praising God in your soul about that because God may be getting ready to let His wind blow through your church, let His breezes blow through in order that He might blow out that which would harm the crop next year, and then there'll be more shouting, then there'll be a better response, next year there'll be a better crop. And so, ladies and gentlemen, God sends the winter time in order that the crop may be better, in order that the church may be purified. But there's a third reason why God said that he sends winter time, and that is for mercy. Notice again, God causes it to come, whether for correction or for his land, or for mercy. God sends winter time to some of the greatest saints he has for no other reason than the fact that he may stretch them out and give mercy to them and to others around them. You say, preacher, I've never been so up to my ears in trouble in all my life. Never has it been so hard to serve God. And preacher, I beg God to forgive me of every sin that I have ever committed. I don't know of a thing that I have not confessed to God. And yet, preacher, I can't understand it. I don't see God's face. He's hid from me. Everything is going wrong. What's the matter? You're just in winter time in order that God may be merciful to you. He may be getting you shined up, ready to put you out in the crowning day of your life. God has never been able to use men very effectively who refuse to go into wintertime experience. You go back and check it. Jo- Joseph is an example of a man in wintertime because God wanted to extend mercy and grace to Joseph. Go back to that day when his father sends him down to Shechem to carry his brothers some bread and to see how they're getting along in the backside of the wilderness with the sheep. Joseph goes down there to carry them the bread. As he goes down there and his brothers see him, they say, Yonder comes that dreamer. Let's get rid of that dreamer. Let's get him out of our hair. We don't like that dreamer. What had Joseph done in order to make them dislike him? Only one thing. 
That is, God gave him two dreams, and Joseph told his two dreams to his brothers. The two dreams included his brother and his mother and father. He said that in so many words, you will bow down to me. There will come a day when you will be coming to me, and I'll be taking care of you. He told his dreams, and his dreams got him in trouble with his brothers. You say, well, preacher, Joseph ought to have kept quiet about his dreams. He ought never to have told his brothers his dreams. That was a time when I felt that same way about Joseph. But I'm convinced today that God wanted Joseph to tell his brothers his dreams so that they would react as they did react, and God could give mercy to Joseph. My friend, when God tells you to do something, you do it. You're not accountable for the consequences. You're to do what God tells you to do and let God take care of the consequences. Because Joseph told his brothers the dream, they got mad at him. When he went down there, he was going down there for the purpose of carrying them bread. When they brought the, he brought the bread to his brothers, they didn't want his bread. They said, let's throw him in a hole in the ground. Preacher friend, has that ever happened to you? You've come out having stayed in your study all week long, getting bread from God's oven, and you take it out to the people and say, here's some bread from God's oven. And they take the bread, knock it out of your hand on the floor. Say, preacher, we don't need that bread. We don't want that. You came to give them God's bread. And they said, we won't have it. We don't want it. It's not for us. Notice what happened to Joseph there. They take him. They throw him in a hole in the ground. Can you imagine what Joseph would have done if he'd have been one of us today? Down there in the hole in the ground, he'd said, Lord, so far as I know, I'm serving you to the best of my ability, and look what happens. I get in a hole in the ground. I deserve better than this kind of treatment. I don't deserve this. Lord, if that's all I'm going to get out of serving you, I'm quitting right now. If Joseph had quit right then... You and I would have never heard of the great man that he came. We'd have never seen him on the throne of Egypt if he hadn't been willing to stay in that hole in the ground. God left him down there, grooming him, getting him ready in order that he might bless a whole nation and bless the whole world. Now, what happens? He's taken out of the hole in the ground. He goes down into Egypt. He's put in Potiphar's house. He begins to prosper again. No doubt he said, oh boy, I'm being blessed by God, the evidence of God's hands upon me, because Potiphar has put everything in my charge. But wait a little while, a woman problem comes along. A woman enters into his life, Potiphar's wife, and tries to ruin him and has him thrown in jail. And as he gets over there and sits in that jailhouse, if it had been one of us, he'd said, Lord, I'm through for sure this time. I thought by now you would have opened up a big church. I would have thought by now you'd open up a big door. But instead, all I'm doing is out here in the jailhouse. My friend, he didn't respond that way. He just took it as God's plan, God's work for him, because God was getting him ready to bless the whole world out there. What are you doing, Joseph? I'm sitting here in the jailhouse. Oh, Joseph's on a shelf. Joseph's not doing anything for God now. He's on a shelf. That's what many people say about a preacher who's in wintertime, or a Christian in wintertime. They say that fellow's not producing any fruit. He's been shelved by God. You watch about your judging that fella. He may be out there getting groomed and blessed and prepared to bless the whole world while you think that God's put him on a shelf. Now, I want you to notice 13 years pass by, but when 13 years are over, younger years, on the throne in Egypt, feeding the whole land, taking care of his father, taking care of his brothers, taking care of his sister. How come? Because he was willing for God to put him in a deep freeze for 13 years. Can God trust you to put you in wintertime that you can bless the whole land? You go and look at examples of men like Moses, 40 years in the backside of the desert, looking after his father-in-law's sheep, looking after the flock for 40 years. For what purpose? Back there in the desert getting groomed up in order that God might bless the whole land. Not because of backslidden state, but God's getting him ready to bless the land. Look at the prophet Elijah. For two and a half years in hiding, he went out and hid himself. God hid him from the crowd. Most folks would have said, where's that preacher Elijah who stood before Ahab and spoke so eloquently? Where is he? Nobody's seen him for two and a half years. Where is he? out there being groomed and prepared and blessed by God, that when he comes back, 
the greatest revival that Israel had ever known should be experienced because that preacher was willing to go through the wintertime experience for God. Look at Job yonder, covered head to foot with sores for one reason only, in order that he might be used to bless the land. Job, what are you doing? I'm out here in the wintertime with God's cold and God's frost blowing on me in order that I might be a lesson to patience to people all over the world. You say, well, preacher, I know so-and-so over yonder. He never has any troubles. He never has any problems. It may be that God can't trust him enough to put him in wintertime. God may never allow him to be able to bless the land. You see, not everyone is willing for God to put him 13 years through the wintertime like Joseph. Not everyone's willing, like Elijah, to be hid out for two and a half years. Not everyone, like Job, willing to face the wintertime. My friend, are you willing to go through the severe winter where God has you right now and keep you there in order that when you come out, you can occupy your throne and bless the whole land? Yes, God said, I send wintertime for three reasons. I send it either to correct you, either for the benefit of the land, I for mercy. Now, it's up to you to decide which one. If God set the winter time in your life to correct you, then praise God for that. It'll get rid of things that don't need to be there. If God sent it for the benefit of your church, then praise God and thank Him for it. That's what your church needs. If God sent it in order that He may polish you up and use you for the whole world, then bless God for that in order that out of winter time you can be prepared to be the greatest vessel for God or a greater vessel for God than you could ever be without the wintertime experience.